Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. We had a few um, small technical difficulties, so hence the, the small delay. Um, welcome at this uh, webinar Brexit full of uh, relevant, um, really detailed content and expertise. Um, we're joining, um, we are joined actually uh, by Mr. Tim Brickliffe from Oxfordshire in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, Secretary General of uh, AIPH, our partner in um, in this webinar. Media partner is Floriculture International. Um, my name is Joop Hendricks. I'm the director at World Horty Center, which is a unique location in the Netherlands where education, research, private sector companies over 130 collaborate intensively on um, advancing the industry. We have around 30, 35,000 guests per year physically here in the World Horty Center. This year, obviously, most of them, just like you today, in a digital fashion. The reach is fantastic. The content and expertise shared is um, valued uh, to a great extent. So we're glad that you, um, that you found us today as well. We hope to provide you with um, some new insights today about this topic that has almost advancing knowledge with every hour passing. Just a few hours ago, the EU president um, informed that uh, he would expect a deal within a few hours. So we're waiting, hopefully all. Um, Tim, I think you're with us. I would like to uh, present you as the moderator today and please guide us uh, through all the speakers this afternoon. I wish you the best of luck and um, lots of valuable knowledge. Well, thank you, Joop, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning, depending where you are in the world. Good evening, maybe even. And so welcome to uh, the second of our uh, webinars on Brexit and the implications of Brexit for the industry. Today, we're focusing on the cut flower industry. And I'm really pleased that we have a, a great lineup of uh, speakers for you today. Uh, we have speakers and also a panel discussion time. You have the opportunity to put forward questions. Please use the chat facility to do that. And we will collect those questions and they will be given to me. And I will raise them as many as I can anyway with the panelists that we have towards the end. My name, yes, is Tim Briarcliffe. I'm the Secretary General of AIPH, the International Association of Horticultural Producers. And our purpose is to be the world's champion for the power of plants. We have our members, our associations that represent the interests of growers of ornamentals, plants, flowers around the world. Uh, we also are the publishers of Floriculture International magazine, and we would encourage you to join with a free subscription to this magazine and enjoy the over 100,000 readers of the magazine around the world. So AIPH is a, uh, we, we have a number of initiatives that, uh, including the International Grower of the Year. Uh, we produce an annual statistical yearbook along with our uh, colleagues in Union Flirt. Uh, we have initiatives on green city, promoting the importance of plants in the uh, urban environment and in the indoor space. We have the role of approving international horticultural exhibitions, and we support growers in work on novelty protection, on sustainability, on plant health, and matters like this. But today we're really pleased to be able to bring to you, along with uh, the World Horti Center, who we're delighted to be working with, uh, this. Uh, webinar, and we've got a great lineup of speakers for you. Now, Brexit, of course, every time you mention it, it provokes strong views, not just here in the UK, but across uh, Europe and indeed across the world. And so today we're not going to discuss those views. Uh, we're going to go into the more of the real implications for business. What does Brexit mean for the sector? Uh, what do we need to do in the coming weeks as the 1st of January gets closer and closer? There are many points to consider whether or not there is a deal. And we've just heard that there may or may not still be a deal. We don't know yet as the time goes on. Matters that we need to consider, customs, bureaucracy, phytosanitary certification, tariffs, delays, Northern Ireland, exchange rates, all of these kind of things. 
we have many experts with us today and practitioners from within the industry who will help us to answer the questions. We have with us today uh, Eileen Vandenberg from uh, Royal Flora Holland. We have Ian Mitchell from uh, Flamingo Holdings in the UK. We have Stefan Koopman from Rabobank. We have Augusto Solano from Asoco Floras in Colombia. And we have Nigel Jenny from the Fresh Produce Consortium in the UK. So please uh, join in in our discussions today. Please add any uh, questions you want as we go through and we'll collect them up. We'll ask, save all the questions till the end and we'll move from one speaker to the next. But that's enough from me. Let's move straight into our uh, first presentation. And our first presentation is from Eline Vandenberg. And Eline is a program manager of the Holland Flower Alliance. Uh, which is a strategic al alliance between Schiphol Cargo, KLM Cargo, and Royal Flora Holland. Uh, Eline is going to speak to us about the impact of Brexit on the market position of the Netherlands. Welcome, Eline. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tim. And uh, hi again. Uh, I would like to say hi to everybody uh, uh, from the World Horty Center. Um, good afternoon and good morning to, uh, to some of you. Um, what I would like to present uh, during my presentation is the economical impact, what we expect uh, from Royal Flora Holland. Um, so like Tim mentioned, I will do my presentation on behalf of uh, Royal Flora Holland, the flower auction based in the Netherlands. And um, the uh, impact analysis I would like to present to you uh, I would like to say to the international uh, viewers uh, that the impact analysis is made from the perspective of uh, the Netherlands. Um, yeah, I'm working at the public affairs department and together with uh, colleagues at Florio Flora Holland, we prepared uh, impact analysis. Why did we do that? Uh, several reasons, because uh, for the Netherlands, the United Kingdom is a very important export market. Actually, after Germany, it's the second export market. The turnover, uh, the export value in uh, 2019 um, was 855 million euros. Um, and what we noticed during this year that, yeah, obviously there was a lot of attention uh, on the COVID situation. Uh, during the first wave because of the lockdown measures in uh, several countries. Um, but also now at this moment, we are in the middle of the second uh, wave. Um, there again, and, and that's logical, there is a lot of focus on, on uh, uh, the corona situation again. Again, new lockdown measures in several countries. But we realized that during this year, uh, there was little attention yet for the Brexit. And we also realize that the Brexit is getting close. And actually, at this moment, uh, it's just uh, four weeks. And then it's the 1st of January. And everybody was talking about, yeah, we, we know there will be extra costs involved. And there will probably be delays and extra time. So we thought it would be a good idea to get more insight what will be the extra costs um, of the, the Brexit and what will be the extra time. Um, so we, um, that was the reason why to, to pr yeah, prepare the impact analysis. I want to make two disclaimers before I start uh, presenting the analysis. Yeah, uh, still a lot of uncertainties. So uh, yeah, we have made some estimations about the impact. And also, of course, we calculated with estimate values. So if you've done already an impact analysis for yourself, for your own company, it might be that on some topics, uh, your uh, figures will vary with the analysis we have uh, made. The approach of our analysis uh, is that we used four building blocks, the commercial impact, operational, phytosanitary, and financial. And I will present them to you one by one. To start with the commercial impact, then it's good to realize that talking about the export from the Netherlands to the UK, that the division between cut flowers and plants is about, is about 75% are cut flowers and the remaining 23% are plants. And why is that important, this division? Because the expected import duty 
on uh, EU cut flowers is 8%. And for plants, it's uh, 0%. So this, uh, the total impact of the import duty on the total uh, export value will be about 5.8%. Um, on non-EU cut flowers, it's expected um, that there will be no uh, import duty on the cut flowers. So that's interesting, but of course that will be a change in the current situation, that there will be a differentiation between cut flowers from the EU and from non-EU. Talking about the commercial impact, it's also important to stress that um, compared to the current situation, in the new situation, and all, and a lot of documents needs to be prepared. Um, the documents can be prepared once the shipment is ready. So it needs a far more strict uh, preparation process, order process, and no last minute changes can be made anymore. So that's very important to realize, and that will yeah, also have impact in the relation between a grower and an exporter. To summarize the commercial impact, we've calculated because of the import duty that the commercial impact will be 5.8% on the export value. About the operational, let's say the logistics impact, um, we, um, yeah, we, we have uh, used as a background information a KPMG report, which has been done in 2018. And in that report, they estimated that cost, the costs for the custom formalities will be around 78 euros per shipment till 126 euros per shipment. Um, based on the amount of shipments, then the impact of these formalities will be 0.2% on the turnover. Um, what I would like to emphasize as well, because we realized also by uh, reading this report and, and also speaking with exporters, that there is a lot of focus on the export towards the UK, but less uh, focus on the return flow. And that's something to realize as well, But because if you send uh, returnable transport items like trolleys or buckets, you need to report them again to uh, the EU the, or the Netherlands. And also for this real import, uh, documentation and formalities are in, involved. So that's something to realize, not just the documentation, but of course, then again, also extra costs for this documentation, these formalities. If you don't have any experience with export, um, yeah, then you probably already have made a choice whether you're going to organize this yourself in your company or otherwise to uh, outsource these services to an expeditor. And um, yeah, if you choose to do that, then of course also for these services, extra costs are involved. Talking about time, um, the delay, what we expect in the exporters process, that there is extra time needed for the preparation of the documents, also for the inspections. And we think that the expected delay will lie between four hours extra uh, till 24 hours. Why this difference? Um, what we know now is that uh, before a shipment arrives at the UK, a pre-notification must be made. And it must be made four hours in advance. But on the other side, we've also spoken to some exporters and they said, well, we definitely need one day extra in our process and one day extra keeping products on stock means additional costs like inventory costs, interest storage space, and probably also loss of product. That's the delay for the exporter. On the other time, on the other hand, we expect that also there will be delays uh, at the border. How much? We don't know yet, but what we've, what we've seen already now today that there is already kind of a, a gayer situation uh, um, at the moment. Normally there are 6,000 uh, truck uh, transport movements uh, between the UK and the European Union. And I read today that it's 50% more already this month. Uh, and now the average uh, truck movements are 9,000. So that leads to more 
uh, waiting time already now at this moment at the border. For delay, we um, we summarize the impact approximately on 5%, which leads to uh, the operational impact of 5.2%. Then the third building block. Um, before talking about the impact, we would like to uh, emphasize that there probably might be an import restriction on high-risk products. And why is that? And probably you know that uh, this year in April, um, an import restriction was uh, already uh, done by the UK government. Uh, perhaps you remember the discussion about lavender plants, for instance. And these import restrictions had to be withdrawn by the UK because uh, this year they were still part of the European Union and they couldn't uh, impose this measure just from their side. But we expect, because they've introduced this restriction, it might be very well possible that that will going to happen next year. Then the three-stage model you have probably written about. Um, so in three different stages, the uh, import control will be introduced. First, from January on, the focus and inspection on high-priority plants. Uh, from April on, the regulated plants. And from July on, uh, on more regulated plants and also the level of inspection will increase. What we know now is that uh, at least plants uh, will be submitted to uh, phytosanitary inspection and they are going to need a certificate. Uh, but quite recently we also realized uh, that probably also from the 1st of April cut flowers will need a phytosanitary certificate. Um, I don't have any more uh, clear information about that, but that means that that is also going to have a huge impact because, uh, as you remember in, the, in my presentation, I mentioned that 75% of the export consists of cut flowers. Then talking about the costs for phytosanitary inspection, um, our calculation is again also for this part based on the KPMG report. And in the KPMG report, they have spoken about a variation between uh, 102 euros until 190 euros per shipment. And this uh, cost we have uh, validated also with some exporters. And they told us that it might that it's more likely that the cost will be 100 euros per shipment, 190 euros per shipment, or perhaps even more. So that is the reason why we calculated in our calculation with uh, 190 euros per shipment, which leads to an impact of 0.4%. Uh, the fourth um, building block. Yeah, what we uh, see is that at the end of this year and during this year that uh, as well the disposable income as well the customer expenses will be negative. Um, it is forecasted that the recovery trend uh, will happen but will probably uh, be on the same level just in uh, 2024. So that needs some time. And on the expectations, what, what we have is that the rate of the British pound will decline in relation to the euro, at least, uh, yeah, probably at the, in the beginning of the Brexit. So we calculated in our uh, calculation with a currency risk of minus 4% and also a decrease of the disposable income of also uh, minus 4%, which leads to a financial impact of minus uh, 8%. To summarize what I have just explained um, in this overview is that you see that when it comes to documentation, so the documentation for the phytosanitary certificate and the customs uh, declaration, in total that will be around 0 0.6 um, extra costs, what you have to uh, calculate. Input duty, yeah. It says here the total figure of 5.8, but please note that for cut flowers, the uh, eight percent is expected and for plants zero percent so that's why this is a different figure for delay five percent and then the financial impact which leads to our um, estimation that it might well be possible that uh, on one hand the flowers 
will become more expensive because there are more uh, costs in the supply chain. And other, on the other hand, that also the demand for flowers from the UK will decrease from the U EU, I must say. So that's quite quite a huge impact. Um, yeah, for the for the left uh, right part in in your screen, it's still uncertain to what extent. So it might vary somewhere between uh, ten, perhaps twenty percent. But this is what what is quite well expected. The possible consequences, what we um, uh, expect, is that um, for the Dutch growers. Uh, there will especially be impact on flowers which are uh, exported to the UK uh, in a, in a uh, big volume, like chrysanthemums, lilies and gerberas. The probably will have impact on demand and also on the price setting. For buyers, we expect there will be impact on the additional costs, like I just mentioned, and also on decrease uh, on demand. For Royal Flor Flora Holland, the flower auction, it might well have a lot, yeah, some impact on our turnover. And what we expect as well, because there is a division uh, in the future between the import duty on uh, non-EU flowers and EU flowers, we expect there might be a shift as well uh, of non-EU cut flowers uh, sailed and transported directly to the UK. I realize it's a quick, broad overview, but I hope you heard some topics which will, uh, uh, yeah, points out what are more or less the consequences will uh, will be, and also for your country, for your company, uh, what to take into account. Thank you very much. Aline, uh, thank you very much for uh, excellent uh, presentation, and uh, and it's good to see that. Uh, detailed impact analysis still shows a wide range of um, outcomes that could happen, anything from up to 20% right down to a lot less. So, so there's still a lot of questions to be answered in this, uh, like we can see. But thank you for that. And uh, we look forward to asking some more questions to you later on in the panel. And uh, if you have any questions for Eline, please put them into the chat and we will pick them up there. And now we're going to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Mr. Ian Mitchell. He is the Group Technical and Procurement Director for Flamingo Group International Limited, a company that has a turnover of £550 million pounds in cut flowers, produce and plants. Ian's been involved with the Flamingo Group for 23 years, starting off in the homegrown branch in Kenya growing uh, produce and cut flowers for export markets. More recently, he's been the technical director role uh, and uh, developed a preferred partner program for their, for their suppliers and has been involved in managing the supply of flowers to UK retailers. So, um, Ian, we give you a warm welcome. And Ian today is going to talk to us about how Brexit could change the supply of flowers to the UK. Over to you, Ian. Thank you. Yeah, hi, good morning, good afternoon to everybody, um, and a good afternoon in the UK, if you're in the UK, it's a very snowy UK actually today, um, which is the first first snowfall we've seen. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through a little bit about, about um, where we see the market at the moment going in the UK, and where we see it moving forward now with, the, with, with Brexit coming forward. But I thought I'd just give you a quick overview of actually where the impact of, of Flamingo, the Flamingo Group now. Um, we have been growing flowers for many years and more recently we partnered up with and, and being part of a bigger, wider group, which is the Flamingo Horticulture and Afroflora Network, which uh, looks after our supply base from predominantly Kenya, but obviously with Ethiopia being a main supply channel into the European network as well. We are um, we're, we're directly responsible for Afroflora in Holland, Flamingo Flowers BV in Holland and Omniflora in Germany. Uh, there are European colleagues who basically market all of our product into Europe. Uh, Flamingo Flowers BV is a procurement arm for our business as well within buying in from the, from the Dutch market on, on the auction and also direct supplies from the, from, the, from the growers in Holland. So they've been working obviously very closely at the moment with the situation with Brexit of how we actually work with our growers supplying our sites in the UK. Um, we have four, four sites in the UK predominantly for flowers and plants, three flower sites, one plant site. And we source from all around, all around the world. So currently we're sourcing and growing about 1.2 billion roses per year ourselves, coming from Ethiopia and Kenya. 
we on the map there you'll see a number of countries that are basically third party sources for flowers and produce and we obviously source you know, a predominant amount of product from different areas that are coming through to to our uh, from our partner programs we currently pack about 1.2 million uh, bouquets per week yeah, and that basically packed at source in our farms uh, and our sites in the uk and obviously at the moment we do have a huge amount of uh, fair trade product just to give you a bit of background information we're the largest fair trade grower in the world now of, of roses from our ethiopian and our flower sites if we move on to where we are with what's happening with and I know i'll be quite quite quick with some of this stuff um the retailers are, are working on the uk market at the moment working on very much the, the assumption of supply yeah will still come from the current sources um we are seeing that actually over time this position has been moving around because obviously tariff programs have been changing and when the uk gt tariff came into play the number of countries we dealt with still had uh, tariff actions in place as you mentioned uh, and my previous speaker mentioned that obviously the tariff duty set for for holland and european supplies yeah, will be set at eight percent coming into the uk and the more direct supply channels now that we have which is obviously including kenya and colombia and other areas of producing flowers yeah, now have come to an agreement with the uk base and the uk retail, UK, uh, supply chain so the duty level has dropped back off that yeah from where it originally was placed at, at an eight percent level as well and some a little bit higher we're now seeing that as a zero percent duty charge that obviously disadvantages the situation we are with european supply um because of the fact that obviously the is my, my friend mentioned earlier on that we are seeing that chrysanthemums, lilies, you know, geminis, those sort of products coming from Europe will still be commanding that duty plan. What do we think will happen in that? We may imagine I expect there will be a reduction in supply yeah, from that program to impact or reduce the impact of the price bracket in there. So maybe see a reduction in stems or reduction in volume in bouquets or in production units for, for UK retail. The other one you mentioned uh, earlier on, we are very worried that supply chain challenges are going to bring delays. You know, we see delays coming through already in the supply chain. Um, we'll be pushing to move a lot more stock to hold in the UK. Uh, and now that will obviously put some pressures on the on the supply chain, but also more importantly on the product life. The inspection requirements we know is going to increase costs. Um, we've looked at the increased cost pack impact of it. Um, it is going to be quite challenging when the phytosanitary documentation control comes in place on cut flowers on the 1st of April. We will get a learning platform, I guess, from where we see the plant situation arising at the moment, but that actually starts from the 1st of January. But we will obviously have to watch that very closely because that will have an impact on, on the cost of total cost of goods sold. The other one is actually really causing some challenges at the moment with Brexit. And actually, obviously, the marketplace changes in terms of COVID. Um, COVID-19 has really seen a dramatic change in customer behavior, not only from where we saw it in March, when the, you know, the whole play, the whole retail, retail sector did have a complete shutdown in lockdown one due to supply chain challenges going through the retail network, um, and also some areas actually ceasing the supply of non-essential goods. Then at the moment, the marketplace with direct mail volumes and other areas moving up quite considerably as people do more home shopping, is really having an impact as well on other ancillary items like packaging supply uh, and, and options coming through of cardboard. Cardboard now in high demand, demand periods like now is, is always been quite tricky. It's even more exacerbated uh, as we look at it today. Um, you know, areas like Amazon and the other direct mail supplier options or direct to customer options are really, really putting a pressure on that, that position. So that's just a bit of a watch out. We see that market changing. I mentioned direct mail volumes are really high. That is driving the real agenda at the moment in terms of what's happening within the marketplace. And as we see that go forward, that, that to me is going to be a, a step change in the marketplace you know, for the future. The other one that we haven't mentioned really, but obviously the UK um, does have a direct correlation of throughput of product into the UK and then onward into Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. This is going to have a real challenge in the future because of the onward transit uh, issues of plant passporting on plants, first of all. Uh, I'm sure Nigel will come on to this a bit later on in terms of phytosanitary requirements, but also as well that actually the, the commercial impact of doing some of these items direct to market is going to be a ch challenge because you cannot send a phytosanitary documentation with that cost to an individual person in their house. It just doesn't make it viable. 
So Northern Ireland, Republic Ireland for direct mail will be a challenge for the UK people to supply that product going forward. I just thought I'd just literally just pick it out in terms of, I know maybe Nigel may cover off some of this later, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on this, but it just, just to provoke a little bit of thought and a little bit of, of challenge in terms of where we are. Obviously, we're going to see UK GT tariffs come into EU countries, and we mentioned that, and obviously rest, Republic of the rest of the world countries, shall we say, yeah, have now agreements that have minimised impact. Obviously, the duty from Europe will actually impact heavily the Dutch supply, yeah, in terms of actually that, that, that supply channel. But there also will be opportunities for other direct supply channels coming into the UK, and I think they'll be seeing them increased. That will mean that UK destination flights, yeah, which currently doesn't have sufficient capacity on direct routes, could get pressurised. Um, and you may see more expansion of, of uh, more expansion of freight actually into some areas, into other parts of, of Europe. So um, you may see more direct flights going into Southern Ireland, for example, as people look for other routing options to hit European destinations. What we do know, more expensive freight is going into the UK than continental Europe. So that will be uh, subject to offsetting some of the 8% duty charge that we see coming across. Just to pick up on plant health, we mentioned it a little bit more. Obviously, we'll get, um, today's not really about plants, but obviously flowers yeah, and controlled flowers, they still will remain in such in the UK process. Um, roses from around the world in certain places certainly have still have uh, false coddling moth control. And that still remains inspections into into that area. Whether that comes into Europe and then comes back out into into UK, how that will be managed in terms of phytosanitary management yeah, is still yet to be really discovered. And and also we will see how that pans out over the over the future. We mentioned plant health inspections yeah, for re-export. That's really going to impact the volume of product coming through the UK into those areas. So there will be an opportunity for European markets to supply Europe or North or Southern Ireland directly. And I think the other one would basically for, for growers in, in Holland um, and growers in other parts of Europe and phytosanitary inspections and phytosanitary control yeah, or a consolidated approach yeah, will be the only way forward to make it cost effective to get product into the UK. Certainly when we see the fire, fl flower phytosanitary requirements come into place, then definitely consolidation centres yeah, will be very much the, the buzzword, I think. Um, and that will be something we'll have to look at, certainly from the 1st of April going forward. Um, Transport-wise, logistics EU to UK, that is already pressured. People are looking for other options, and obviously we will have a four-hour window for the point of port of entry for actually people to actually notify or notify inspectors to actually meet some of the demanding uh, issues or some of the high-risk products on arrival, which again will be a four-hour window to wait for the inspector to wait for the inspector. That probably could be a bit challenged, but there's an awful lot of inspectors being re-recruited now at border control points, so we can actually see that come through. Consolidation loads of trailers and trailer units coming from uh, to be dropped off rather than having drivers coming across. These will have to be pre-booked in the future, we understand it, and there'll be pre-bookings on the tunnel as well. So that, that again, will put into some, some areas of delays. Um, the other one, basically, we will be having product coming through the UK, we'll have you know, PODs as well. So we'll be putting our position forward for Flamingo to have point of destination uh, areas so we can actually then monitor product coming through direct to, direct to us with inspectors. And the other one really was, I was just picking up on the plant health, really just to put it out into a different area that actually direct mail will be affected. And also as well, you'll see no flowers and plants can be re-exported to the EU you know, without the certification and plant passporting process. This will delay things and also this will have an impact on product. And also, well, the inspection costs are quite consume very basic very financially consuming yeah at a certain rate for an inspector to come inspect those plants or the flowers in the future so that's really just a bit of an overview of where we're seeing the marketplace in the uk um you know volume and volume seems to be still driving a very good way but we obviously have to now balance up some of the value costs that we're going to have in this marketplace before we actually see it go into uh, into the, the full brexit impact Thank you very much indeed for your time, and I look forward to taking questions later. Ian, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. A really uh, helpful insight into the things that you're facing as a business and the things that you are uh, having to look into. Please stay around along with the other speakers to the for the panel session, and we will have some more uh, questions uh, for you there. So thanks again very much, Ian. Uh, we're going to move on now to our next speaker. Our next speaker 
is Stefan Koopman from uh, Rabobank. He is a senior market economist at Rabobank. He's responsible for analyzing developments in the interest and currency markets and communicating the Rabobank expectations to Dutch uh, target groups. He's a real focus on Brexit and the Bank of England, and he writes articles and commentary on anything that moves the financial markets. And so we're very pleased that he's going to speak to us today about the economics of trading with the UK post-Brexit. Over to you, Stefan. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you, Tim. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is indeed Stefan Koopman, and I, I work as an economist at Rauwbank, which is a, a Dutch-based bank that is mo mostly active in the food and agri market. In the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I would like to give a, a brief talk on the latest developments in the UK economy, which uh, actually faces uh, two shocks at the same time. I will try to shed some light on how this could affect the currency markets. And then I will uh, yeah, try to, to explain how this all broadly affects uh, the trade of the goods between the EU and, and the UK. As an economist working in uh, these financial markets and alongside uh, currency and bond traders, um, my job is not uh, to have a very detailed understanding on all the specific rules and regulations uh, that will change just because of Brexit. Even though I, I perfectly understand that, that some of these uh, details can be extremely important uh, for businesses uh, such as yours. But instead, what our clients expect from me and from us is to see whether we can come up with some uh, strategic views on how we see the UK economy developing in one or two or even five years ahead. So, so around this time last year, right after the uh, withdrawal agreement was signed, I had to formulate a new outlook for this year. Uh, clients asked me, is this going to be a really hard Brexit or is it going to be a so-called Brexit in a name only? Well, if you look at uh, Brexit only from an economic perspective as economists, um, yeah, tend to tend to do, you would be very inclined to expect this to be a very soft uh, Brexit. After all, that's uh, what everyone thinks that's the most uh, rational thing to do. But what these type of an analysis typically misses is that over the past two or three years, the entire concept of Brexit has been defined in a, in a much harder way. Uh, Boris Johnson has actually been uh, quite straightforward on this. Brexit without taking any control back of the UK's uh, rules and regulations has no real purpose. And the EU has also been very clear in turn that the British push for more sovereignty has a very high price. The UK will lose its direct access to the, U to the European markets and the UK's trade, uh, trade relations will become much more complicated and costly than before. And this will be the case regardless of whether a deal is conclu concluded this weekend perhaps or uh, at some point later this month and yeah obviously time is running in very short supply here but the expectation in financial markets right now is that we may see uh, the outlines of a deal as soon as this weekend but also that, Bre that brexit certainly uh, won't be finished on january the 1st so there is no real end point or steady state in this new uh, eu uk relationship regardless of, of whether we see a deal or not so what would then be the impact of Brexit? Well, that will be very complicated to measure because we are in the midst of a once in a lifetime pandemic and we have recently uh, rerun our numbers again. And we now expect that the British economy will contract by 11.5% this year. You can uh, see that in the table uh, on the right side of your screen. And this is the steepest decline in more than 300 years. And we also think that there will be a, uh, a fairly slow recovery in the next two years. And uh, yeah, we are in that sense a little bit more pessimistic than the official forecasters uh, for the UK con economy, such as the Bank of England or the OBR. So if there is a deal, uh, we expect uh, GDP growth uh, to come in at 3.9% uh, in uh, 2021 and 5.4% uh, in 2022. And if we don't get a deal, uh, then we think that the economy will grow 0.9% next year and 3.5% in 2022. So even though we do forecast economic growth in both these scenarios, uh, we think that the recovery will always be incomplete. And this is because the economy faces uh, yeah, what economists tend to call uh, an unholy trinity of risks. And uh, this is the coronavirus, these are the practical realities of Brexit, and it is the expected rise in uh, UK unemployment. And you can also see this uh, on the chart on the, on the left. 
The GDP dropped around 25% uh, this spring when the economy uh, shut down uh, uh, from the middle of March. And that, that was, of course, because of the first wave of COVID. And there has been a recovery in the economy over the course of the summer. But this was certainly not enough to compensate for all the losses that we had in, in, the, in the early months uh, of the spring. So even before uh, the November lockdown, GDP was still more than 9% um, below its peak. So that's quite a, a big gap there. And the second dip that we are now seeing is expected to be uh, much smaller as uh, several sectors such as manufacturing or construction are still able to operate. And that wasn't the case uh, uh, during the spring. But at the same time, we all know that most of the UK's retail has been shut in November. So we still think that the economy could contract around uh, 3% in this quarter and then slow, slowly recover from uh, January onwards if the economy uh, is able to fully reopen because of the, because of the vaccines. So the pandemic and Brexit together is a very uh, risky combination in our view, but we don't expect that Brexit itself would lead to yet another recession in 2021. And this is of course based on the assumption that there will, there will be a deal. However, Brexit will have some uh, long-term implications. And you can also see this on the chart on the left. Um, yeah, we expect that it will take quite a while before GDP returns to its uh, pre-pandemic level. That's the dotted line in this chart. We currently forecast that this will happen in around uh, three years and that it takes uh, much longer if there is no deal. And that's the light blue line in this, in this chart. So over time, if there is no deal, we believe that uh, quite a, a wide gap uh, can open up uh, in, in the economy. And this could be as large as, as 2,600 pounds per person per year uh, in 2030. So that's quite a, a quite a, a steep drop in GDP. So why is that? Yeah, even though the immediate impact of Brexit is, is overshadowed by the virus, there's a quite a clear consensus uh, among economists that Brexit will have a negative effect on the UK's potential rate of economic growth. And you could, you could see this rate of growth as the, uh, the rate of growth that the UK typically achieves in a very normal uh, business as usual kind of year. And, and this slide uh, here is, is mostly for your reference, so I, I don't want to go into all the details, but there's quite a simple uh, rule of thumb uh, here. So the, the bigger the economic distance between the EU and the UK, uh, the bigger the economic consequences are uh, for the UK. And this is simply because the UK relies more on its trade with the EU than the other way around. And we've also done some studies into this potential growth rate and found that it would be a bit uh, below 2% per year if there was no Brexit, around 1.5% per year if there will be a Brexit with a deal and around 1% per year if there will be no trade deal at all. And that, that this may sound like a small beer, but it does add up to quite large numbers over time if you compound these. Yeah, so eventually, the impact of, of Brexit would be larger than the impact of the virus, even as the virus uh, caused uh, quite a, a steep recession, and Brexit probably won't. So what about the currency? Well, the good news here, in our view, is that Brexit has already been reflected in the currency uh, since it uh, plunged in 2016. And since then, sterling has been trading mostly sideways against uh, the euro with a natural ebb and flow that you typically see in, in these kind of markets. So this implies that if the UK and the EU do strike a deal in the next few days or weeks, we don't expect to see another sharp uh, depreciation uh, just because of the realities of Brexit. That said, even though the political risk will decline if there is a deal, we don't think that the pound will appreciate much either. The economic uncertainty remains quite large, yeah? this, this uh, unholy trinity of risks, and the UK will be uh, structurally less attractive for foreign capital than it was uh, before Brexit. So our central forecast is that uh, the euro sterling exchange rate would move from 89 cents, uh, as it is trading right now, to around 87 cents over the course of 2021. And you can see that in the orange line in this chart. This will, of course, be entirely different if there is no deal. Uh, the financial markets have been fairly optimistic on these Brexit negotiations. So if it still breaks down, the traders will try to sell the pound and buy uh, back dollars or euros. So the risk of a very sharp depreci depreciation is, however, 
less pronounced than it was in 2019, when there was a lot of, lot of drama between deal or no deal. And there was a very wide uh, range of possible outcomes because even no Brexit at all was still a, a realistic pos uh, possibility back then. So we will see uh, a move towards uh, 93 cents, perhaps 94 cents, if there was uh, no deal being concluded, if, if there is no deal being concluded in the next few days or weeks. And you can see that in the light blue line. Well, there's also a dotted line in this chart, and this is the worst case scenario where all the risks uh, that we currently see in the UK economy materialize. I think of a no deal Brexit, think of vaccines that are still delayed or ineffective, think of new lockdowns, uh, a sharper rise in unemployment, and perhaps even negative interest rates from the, from the central bank. In such a scenario, the pound could move towards an exchange rate of one against the euro. And obviously this would make uh, UK imports of EU goods very expensive, also because we are likely to see in such a scenario, in such a scenario that there will also be tariffs that would average around uh, 8%. So then you have a very uh, steep increase in, in, in your costs. Well, finally, how would this all affect uh, trade between the EU and, and the UK? Well, regardless of, of, of whether a deal is struck, the cost of trade uh, will rise because of the wide variety of non-tariff barriers that we are going to see. Elina has told you uh, already about this in, in, in a lot more detail. And we estimate that um, these non-tariff barriers would have an equivalent tariff value of around 5 to 10 percent, which is broadly the same, the same as the average tariff under no deal. So that would suggest that the deal that we are maybe uh, are going to see is somewhere uh, a halfway house between no deal and no Brexit at all. Then we have an expected rise in unemployment. And the UK government has been very generous with its furlough scheme, but this scheme is expected to stop in March. And the official forecast from the OBR is that unemployment will rise uh, to 7.5% in the summer of next year, and it is currently 5%. We think that it could even be a little bit higher than this, unless the government extends uh, this furlough scheme once more. And that's, uh, that, that is a possibility. So what this would mean if they don't do that is that the income and the confidence of UK consumers will remain under pressure, even as the economy starts to recover from the pandemic. And we forecast that total com consumer spending on goods next year could drop two or 3% relative to what we've seen during this summer, so after the first uh, lockdowns, and that some of this spending will shift back uh, to services. And if you then take the exchange rate, this could be, uh, in our view at least, a, a slightly positive factor of around 2%. So, so here I disagree a bit with, uh, with Aileen. But this is again based on, on the premise of a deal. Otherwise, we would see uh, a depreciation of around 4%. So if you add all these factors together, and you also have to make some assumptions on the price elasticities of your product. These elasticities are the sensitivity of your sales volumes to a 1% change in the price, uh, in the selling price of your goods, or a 1% change in the income of the UK consumer, or a 1% change in the relative price to other goods that, does, that don't need to be uh, imported. And we all know that these elasticities are typically higher for luxury goods, which are nice to have and they're higher for luxury goods than they are for the basic goods or the necessities which are need to have so if you combine these elasticities with the expected increase in prices we calculate that the expected drop in trade volumes from the eu to the uk is around five percent for for basic products to around 15 percent for luxury products and yeah our, our view is that that cut flowers um, yeah risk to be on, on the upper end uh, of this of this distribution so um, that would be quite a steep uh, reduction in volume. And, and with this, I'd like to hand over uh, my uh, virtual mic uh, to Tim. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. Stefan, thank you very much uh, once again for excellent uh, presentation and a great insight into the bank's uh, predictions of uh, what's going to happen and under the different scenarios. Uh, so if anyone has any questions for Stefan, please put them in the chat. We will collect them and uh, ask them later on. Um, so thank you very much again for your presentation. We're going to welcome now uh, to join us Mr. Augusto Solano. Uh, Augusto is the executive president of the Association of 
Colombian flower exporters, Asoco Flores. Welcome, Augusto. It's in. Uh, it's coming to us today from Bogota. So it's morning to you in Bogota. Uh, in his role, he's responsible for leading the process of making Colombia's flower industry more competitive, uh, with a focus on sustainable development and social responsibility. Uh, Soco Flores started in 1973 to promote the flower sector internationally and uh, develop Colombian uh, floriculture. So we give a warm welcome to Augusto. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to do this by um, doing a bit of an interview. So I'm going to ask some questions of Augusto and Augusto, please do uh, answer and uh, uh, branch out uh, on the topics, however much, uh, however much you feel. But uh, welcome. Do you want to uh, start at all by telling us anything about uh, Asoka Flores that I haven't mentioned already? Uh, thank you, team. Uh, thank you to World Orti Fair, Jeff Hendricks, and, and to you and all the colleagues here. Well, uh, as you said, Asoka Flores has been from uh, 1973 working for the flower industry in Colombia. Uh, we are now the second world exporter of flowers and the, by far the first supplier of flowers to the United States. We uh, have, uh, we send our flowers to a hundred destinations in a hundred countries. And uh, well, we, we, we've been uh, very much focused on sustainable floriculture. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, and uh, congratulations for bringing this subject that is important not only for the UK or for the European Union, but for the whole uh, uh, world, uh, the, the supply chain of, of uh, flowers. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could tell us what is the value of flowers Colombia sells into the UK market? Well, I think it's around uh, 60 million euro uh, dollars. Uh, we measure our, our, our exports mainly in, in dollars. Uh, around that, uh, this year has dropped by about 15 percent because of uh, of the COVID, and uh, it has been an important uh, market for us. As I told you, we mainly supply 80 percent of our flowers go to the United States, and uh, but the UK has been our second market many times, several times, and uh, it's important. We have we have a lot of uh, uh, trust and, and we put a lot of effort in selling our flowers to the to the UK. We've done uh, in the past several promotion campaigns and uh, this is a market we care much about. Okay. <laughs> is, it, is it possible to say what proportion of the flowers that come into the UK go via another EU country like the Netherlands, for example? I think it's difficult, but it, it does, it does. Uh, the point is that uh, the, the flower industry is a very integrated uh, supply chain. So you cannot say that you, you can handle it independently, but it's, it's all interconnected. I think uh, part of that is, is in these $60 million However, I think part is not is not there, and uh, it's something we we, we can uh, we can lose, and we worry about uh, that. Even though we can have a direct uh, trade agreement with the UK. Okay. Okay. So, what do you see then as the main, from your perspective, what are the main implications of Brexit for the flower industry? Well. Even though it's not our largest market for the whole industry, I think it's very important. And being a, a board member of Union Flores, I've been involved somehow in this because Union Flores, which is the floral organization that works on trade, has been working on this since, since uh, 2016 with the whole thing started, precisely because uh, it pointed out that uh, the UK is highly dependent on imports, on floral imports, and 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 also the Brexit is going to have a huge impact uh, uh, on the global economy somehow. Uh, but I think in the floral industry has a very uh, heavy weight. It, it has a heavy weight because UK is has been one of the three largest importer of flowers in the world. 
at some point it was the largest importer in the world. The culture uh, of the uh, in Britain about uh, gardening, flowers, plants, and everything is difficult to find in, in in many in other in other countries. So this is this is a key country, but the specific weight for for flowers is 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 uh, really important about the supply chain. Uh, on the other hand, is the the type of product. Our product is very perishable. It's very delicate. It's not like other products that can have delays and weights. I think uh, the, the the three uh, speakers that were ahead of me from representatives from uh, Royal Flora Holland, Flamingo, and Rabobank have given very uh, complete explanations, and 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 it's very difficult to add to to what they have said. But the integrated nature of uh, of the of the supply uh, flower supply chain has a, a lot uh, a lot to do with uh, with this and uh it's important to guarantee duty free access uh for flowers everywhere that has been our main uh, concern and uh, that's what we've been working from union first uh, 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 which is right in, in brussels uh, the, the the hot spot uh, for this kind of uh, for this kind of thing so far, we have, uh, I mean, uh, as we've seen, access to the market and, and duties is one thing, but that's not all. So, uh, uh, I think Kenya has already in place, uh, and Ecuador, they have in place uh, uh, trade agreements, and Colombia also. We also got approval last month from our parliament. Uh, and now it has to go for signature for the president and then to the constitutional court. I think that the toughest part was the parliament uh, because during COVID, protectionist, protectionism has arised again. And it wasn't about flowers, but this deal between Colombia and UK has a lot of things, investments, uh, mining oil and some of the products and there were a lot of enemies about this so it wasn't easy but finally we we got through this and then at this point we have the main suppliers to the uk uh kenya ecuador and colombia maybe but uh, the the one that is missing is is the eu hopefully and from what i've seen i think uh we're gonna get it however that's not all and, uh, and, and, and and it's going to be more costly. There's going to be uh, less, uh, more costly for 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 this for for the people in the, in the UK. They're going to be more unemployment. So it's not good for the industry. And even if you don't have a direct impact, uh, somehow this is all interconnected, and this disruption is going to have an, an an effect. So. Uh, we have to work together to see how we can mitigate the effects of uh, of this uh, of 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 this uh, big huge change in in trade. Thank you. Uh, do you expect to see uh, more of your sales going directly to the UK from Colombia rather than uh, via the Netherlands, for example? Only. I, I would say that only if there is not a, a deal between the EU and the UK soon, but that's not the best option. We'll rather have it the other way. Uh, uh, we'll like uh, business as usual because for us, you know, one thing that has been affected here in, with this pandemic is logistics. Uh, transportation is much more limited. It's not flexible. So it's not so easy to, to make changes. So if we have to do them, uh, we'll do it. Uh, we'll find a way. It's not. It's going to be maybe uh, more costly and not quickly, not quick enough. Uh, so only if uh, that doesn't happen, the, the deal doesn't happen with the EU. Of course, we'll, the, 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 our trade will go more directly. But still, we think the best thing is to have things as close as. They have been in the past, uh, especially during this pandemic that is going to last uh, some time. Okay, so your feeling from Colombia is that business as usual is your preferred option. And um, But I wonder if you've got businesses in Colombia, in the flower industry, that are looking at this as a new opportunity to 
develop a route to market. For example, in the event of a no deal and tariffs affecting flowers from EU, is this a new opportunities that are being seen from Colombia, or do you still see that the, um, the, the, the additional costs and the difficulties of logistics will make that difficult to take advantage of? Tim, our growers, some of our growers that uh, supply that market may see some opportunities, but I think that the disadvantages offset those opportunities. It's going to be more costly. There are going to be problems in, in, in purchasing power and, and, and all that. So, uh, yes, people will try to, to take advantage of some things, but they will be upset somehow. But the increased cost of the whole process, the phytosanitary thing, the delays and everything. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, we will, but uh, I think uh, there will be offset by these uh, obstacles. Okay, well, thank you. That's been a really uh, helpful um, discussion with you on the, on your perception of the uh, trade from as a as a third country supplier from outside of uh, the EU. Uh, if anyone has any more questions for Augusto, please put them into the chat, and I will put them to him during the panel session that we have later on. But thanks very much for sharing your uh, thoughts on Brexit today, and uh, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time for that. Thank you. Please stay with us for the panel later, um, and uh, many thanks. Thank you, Tim. We're now going to move on to our final speaker before we have the panel. The final speaker is Mr. Nigel Jenny. Nigel is the CEO, the Chief Executive of the Fresh Produce Consortium within the UK. Uh, he heads up that team, providing um, uh, growth and increasing the membership of that and representing the UK fresh produce industry. Um, Nigel is also an executive director of Freshfell, which is the EU trade association for fresh produce based in Brussels and the International Federation of Produce Standards. He has a long experience within the sector and has been very active and involved in the uh, issues surrounding Brexit for flowers and also the whole of the fresh produce industry. So we're very pleased to have Nigel with us today and uh, we pass over to you now, Nigel. Thank you very much. Tim, thank you very much. And um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, be part of this discussion today. Um, a few th thoughts for myself, really, is that, you know, I know I note the concerns of the previous speakers regarding the potential impact on sterling and the additional operational administrative costs which are all likely to be substantial in all aspects of the produce sector trading with the EU. However, I would like to just walk with a little bit of optimism and just hope that challenge brings opportunity to a range of businesses. So briefly, in terms of the Fresh Produce Consortium, we are the trade association for the fruit and vegetable, flower and plants, industry in the UK and many of our members are worldwide organisations. In terms of Brexit, we have had, I wouldn't say always enjoyable, but extensive uh, debates and exhaustive discussions with the UK government and endeavoured to encourage the adoption of an effective but hopefully minimal approach in terms of impact on the industry in terms of the new processes and regulations. However, our politicians have taken a, a different mindset, should we say. I think it's important just to remind ourselves that from a UK as a nation, we import 65% of all of our fruit and vegetables and around 90% of all of our flowers and plants. So we are heavily reliant as a fantastic global trading partner sourcing from around the world. As an organization, we have provided extensive and regular updates to members, and we also offer a one-stop shop comprehensive guide to all aspects of managing that import and export process in terms of both um, customs, uh, tariffs, phytosanitary, marketing standards, and much, much more. So with our colleagues on, you know, on, the, on the chat today, from the you know, colleagues from the EU, I'd really ask you this question. Do you feel that you're prepared? 
whilst, as we all know, in a very snowy UK today, trade negotiations are ongoing, and let's hope there is some level of agreement in the coming days, if not today, perhaps. However, there's a very clear message from the UK government that it wants to secure its sovereignty for, sovereignty for the future, and at the same time, perhaps in an aggressive manner, is suggesting we're ready for Brexit, but we're not sure Europe is. I think we need to reflect and remind ourselves that a business as usual approach is not an option. Whatever is agreed with the UK, we will not be part of the single market or the customs union. So fundamental change, regardless of what may be agreed in the next few days, is going to happen. For example, border management to support both European exports and UK imports is a reality. As we've already heard, that brings cost, complexity and potential delay. From a UK border point of view, let's just understand a little bit further about what the UK uh, government is, is, is suggesting about how its border will be managed in the near future with Europe. Effective, there are three key dates that you need to put in your diary, really. One is the 1st of January, one is the 1st of April, and the next is the 1st of July. 1st of January is the key date for a combination of things, but particularly for those businesses that trade in plants with the UK. Additional regulations will come into place on that day, and in essence, for high priority plants, uh, which is a, which is most plants in reality, you will require a phytosanitary certificate to export to the UK. 1st of April, in essence, that then encompasses a whole new group of products, which includes uh, regulated products, which includes cut flowers and fresh and a range of fresh fruit and vegetables. At that 1st of April date, you will be required to provide documentary information, which is the requirement of a phytosanitary certificate, and present that information through the new UK government IT systems. 1st of July brings the position when the UK has built a number of new border or near border inspection facilities, physical inspections may take place on those goods as they arrive from Europe. So briefly, remember from the 1st of January, you will have to manage your customs import processes and your export processes. But from a UK perspective, you are allowed a period of time. If you wish to defer those up to the 1st of July, you are able to do so. But you do need to have the documentary evidence before the 1st of July to then manage those individual declarations. I think the biggest challenge that we may well face is from a plant health point of view. As I mentioned a little while ago, is Europe ready? When you evaluate, as I've already suggested, the substantial trade between Europe and the UK, our estimates are, suggest that there are around two and a half million consignments which are likely to require phytosanitary certificates come next year and that is for a combination of plants cut flowers and fruits and vegetables so it's a substantial change in terms of delivering documentary and official evidence so from that point of view my challenge would be wherever you're based in europe perhaps do you have the necessary official capacity physical point of view from the first of April and before for certain products, documentary checks of that information will occur. But from the 1st of January for plants and from the 1st of July for the other categories, physical official inspections may take place at a combination of destinations. The levels of those inspections are yet to be publicly announced, but I hope through the encouragement and pressure of FBC, that those levels of inspections will be as low as practically possible. I think we should also reflect on how you choose to manage 
your logistics between Europe and the UK as well. Given that we've talked about a range of products now requiring a phytosanitary certificate, a range of goods at higher or lower risk from a phytosanitary and biosecurity point of view, you need to think carefully about when you're using groupage, which I accept is essential for our industry, you ensure that your fellow users of those vehicles have got the right documentation. Otherwise, your consignment could well be stopped while you're waiting for somebody else's goods to be inspected and just reflect on the goods that are, in inverted commas, a higher risk that may require a greater level of physical official inspection in the UK that may allow or may encourage delays of you or your customers receiving those goods in the UK. I think again, what's also important, and I think it was raised by a colleague a few minutes ago, it isn't just about arriving in the UK, it's getting those vehicles and, those, and that packaging, whatever it may be, back to Europe as well. So that is something that does need to be considered and reflected on. In terms of um, non-European countries, so in fact, the rest of the world, as you're aware, the and my, my friend a few minutes ago talked about uh, new agreements with the UK. The UK government has been for some time um, renegotiating direct agreements with a range of non-European countries. In essence, the official term is continuity agreements. Um, a number of those have been signed and agreed, but I would encourage you to keep checking our website, keep checking other areas, because there are still a significant number of those agreements yet to be signed with the UK government. So they are important. Certainly from a flower point of view, a number have already been signed or are, are close to being signed, but it is important that they are signed and agreed before the 1st of January. Otherwise, that trade defaults to the new UK global tariff, which in essence means a higher level of duty from what is likely to be nil or very low levels of duty. Remember, if um, we don't have some form of agreement in the coming days or weeks with the European Union, the UK global tariff will also apply, which as my as earlier speakers have highlighted, that does bring a change of dynamics in terms of where duties is payable or not payable and the potential impact on those commercial supply chains. So I don't think I'm going to go into too much detail at this time. I think the early speakers have given you an overview. What I'm trying to do is just encourage you to reinforce many of those key points, but just reflect on what does Europe need to do to do as much as possible to trade as seamlessly as possible with the UK and be prepared. I'm, I, we all see lots of information about how prepared the UK businesses are and how prepared European businesses are. And frankly, that's even tougher, um, especially from a more, more modest business with the challenges of COVID we've had in recent months. But I would suggest that many businesses are still not fully understanding what is required and are not prepared. So if I can give you any encouragement to prepare, please do so, um, because the UK is moving to a new era, but it is moving to an era where it is very, very keen to trade with our European and worldwide partners to build future and stronger relationships for the future. So, Tim, I think that's probably all from me at this time, but I'm obviously happy to answer any questions as they may come up in a few minutes. Nigel, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, a great uh, overview and it's um, uh, good that you were able to come in at this point. So you're very knowledgeable on many of these areas and you can sum up the things where we have a few gaps. So thank you very much for that uh, overview. I know you're playing a really important role in the uh, in keeping the industry informed on this issue and lobbying on this issue and uh, informing
consumers. I had my lunch yesterday and turned the radio on, and I heard you on the radio as well over here. So, apologies, um, Tim. I hope it didn't turn you off your lunch. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, so now we're going to a panel and uh, going to invite the other speakers back. If you could all uh, rejoin um, and click on the screen and your microphone and come back in. Uh, see if we get Augusto as well. Still there, if Augusto is there, maybe the team can. Ah, here we go, yes, so everyone is back, that's great. Uh, Thanks very much. Now, I'm going to ask uh, some questions which have been put up by uh, the audience and also some others I have. Please, though, feel free to add in any other points or ask questions yourselves within the panel. Uh, audience can still ask questions now on the chat, and I will try and uh, keep track of them while they are there. And uh, please ask them in English, which will help me, certainly. So. Um, so let's, uh, we went, uh, we started off with Eileen and uh, Eileen is there in the very nice World Horty Centre facility in the Netherlands. And uh, <laughs> uh, we want to just start with a, a couple of questions for uh, Eileen. Um, and I, I was going to ask you what it is you plan to do with the outcome of all the analysis work that you have done, uh, that you presented to us today. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Tim, that's a good question. Um, of course, the impact analysis while doing it, it gave us a, a lot more insights, but um, it would be a little bit too late if we would have acted just now uh, uh, by, um, yeah, uh, having, uh, uh, yeah, by knowing the consequences and just act now. So since the beginning of the Brexit, we followed very closely what are, uh, yeah, the announcing of the Brexit, we followed closely what are the developments. And of course, yeah, from uh, our perspective, um, also like mentioned in the former presentation and especially the presentation of Mr. Solano, uh, we are also um, yeah, trying to mitigate the risk uh, of business as usual, what we are facing today compared to the situation I described in my presentation. So our lobby is, uh, is focused on, on mitigating the risk, uh, yeah, hopefully for input duties, which are as low as possible, and also with as less trade barriers as possible. And in the Netherlands, we do the lobby not just by ourselves, but also together with uh, the VGB, the trade association in the Netherlands, and also Mr. Solano mentioned already Union Fleur, which we're very closely uh, working with together also on European level. Thank you. And is there is there an expectation amongst the growers that you're going to keep the business that is there with the UK now? Or are they anticipating that some of it will go? Are they looking at other market opportunities? How, what is the view? Um, I don't have any signs yet that they're uh, le yeah, yeah, that they're actually leaving the, the British market, of course. What we noticed, and that's already have been a kind of a development since uh, the announcement of the Brexit, that we see some growers diversifying their assortment. So if they so far have been an assortment which was 100% suitable for the for the UK market, that you see now, uh, especially for lilies and uh, chrysanthemums, that they're also planting other varieties which are suitable for and, and interesting for other markets as well. Mm. So they're covering themselves a bit on that area. Yeah. Um, yeah. Has uh, any other of the panelists noticed any uh, changes in uh, suppliers, the way they are viewing the UK market and maybe looking elsewhere? Any comment, Ian? Do you have noticed anything on that? No, we haven't really seen anything too much yet. I think there's almost an, almost an uncertain level at the moment of everybody sort of saying, well, Let's hope there's a business as usual at the moment, a little bit. Um, so I think we'll see that probably act a little bit more when there's a bit more known entity, what the marketplace will start to look like post-January 1. Yeah. Um, we've just had a question come in uh, regarding uh, flowers from Turkey. Um, uh, for, so for our cut flowers from Turkey, the question it says for some of our UK customers have been delivered to Holland and the flowers were taken to the UK. As of January the 1st, our UK customer will re-export the flowers to the UK. 
Are there any extra customs cost for it? Well, I think uh, Eileen uh, covered this area and to say there was in an event of a no deal, there's no expected tariffs for flowers that are from a third country that come through um, the Netherlands. Is that right, Eileen? Um, yeah, that's the case, uh, at least when they are not uh, imported in the, in the EU at the moment. So if they are uh, uh, received in transport and exported again, then uh, they are still considered as uh, non-EU flowers and then there's no uh, import duty involved. Yes, unless they are uh, repackaged and <laughs> then they become a new product, uh, yes. Yeah, and value um, yeah. However, I'm sure that the... Uh, it, costs of notifying and declaring and the additional costs that are coming through that will still apply as it does to any product from the EU. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you want to comment on that, Nigel? No, I, th I think you've summarised it, Tim. I think, you know, there are a number of options how you can, let's say, transit through Europe rather than clearing uh, European customs that maybe become a, a critical business mindset to minimise those potential extra costs. But you know, I, I I don't think businesses should ignore the the additional administration, time, efforts, and bureaucracy of completing the things that will now be necessary to manage business in the future. So the kind of uh, percentages of up to even twenty percent of extra costs that Eileen presented seem about right to you. Would you say, Nigel? <laughs> Um, I, I would I would walk with some positivity and hope that the numbers are nowhere near as high as that. But I I fully accept the the well thought through logic of the earlier presentation. Um, you know I think what will make a great difference to that worst case nineteen percent is that if there is some form of agreement where there is no um, where there is no uh, tariff between the EU and the UK and perhaps. You know, our politicians may just surprise me as well, and uh, sterling has a rise rather than the fall, which I think was uh, the prediction, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Stefan, did you want to comment on that? <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, I can uh, agree with what uh, with what Nigel just said. Um, uh, we think it's more likely that if there is a deal that we are going to see, we are going to see a slight uh, appreciation of, of sterling, and that could even uh, go a little bit uh, uh, further if, if this deal is some sort of prelude to an e, uh, to, uh, towards a, a UK-US trade deal, which of course is also in the works in the background, but seems very unlikely uh, at this stage yet. Uh, thank you. Yes, I didn't imagine we be talking about a UK US deal in this call but this is uh, interesting <laughs> dimension of course because all of these things have an impact and, yep. and and I think something coming out very clearly from your presentation Stefan is the um, the economic conditions in the UK and how that will affect consumer spend and the view of um, uh, of, of products like flowers and how that will be impacted when uh, GDP is down and individual household uh, spending is down. Um, so I think um, uh, your uh, how are you uh, advising Stefan your your customers in light of your predictions? Well, if if I if I look at from a, a broader strategy, the thing is uh, that the world is is, is changing uh, quite uh, rapidly from a, a very business-friendly, trade-friendly, liberal world in which the relationships between uh, countries are being arranged and settled on a, a multilateral basis. And this ultimately led to the, to the rise of the WTO, for instance, to a world that is much more polarized and much more based on bilateral relationships. It's, it's very zero-sum or a quid pro quo, actually. So that means that these events that we are seeing, such as Brexit, uh, the dismantling of the WTO, or the US-China trade war, are not isolated events. And so instead, it is our view that we can see uh, more of these types of events in the upcoming years. And this will complicate life for businesses who are active in foreign markets. So that's why we advise clients to, to either uh, diversify um, their own client base in terms of geography, and that, that makes them, of course, uh, less exposed to these kind of um, 
these kind of event risks. Or we could uh, advise them to, to simplify or to shorten uh, their own supply chains and, and their routes into the markets that they are selling into and see whether it is possible to, to shift from just-in-time strategies to more of, of, of a just-in-case strategy. However, I, I understand that um, that is relatively easier to achieve for uh, manufacturers who have very lengthy supply chains than it is for uh, businesses who are active in the flower market with uh, with these peris perishable uh, goods, but I still th still think that um, growers could make good use of these insights as well. Yeah. Thank you, um, Ian. Uh, I wonder uh, how Flamingo will be looking to change its business. What what sort of business changes are you considering in light of the uh, implications of Brexit? Um, well, our, our first one really is actually we are rerouting an awful lot of our aircraft obviously into the UK uh, to start off with. So that's a fairly fundamental change that means that our, our air freight bridge is more uh, concentrated around the UK delivery. Um, we are changing a consolidation approach. And um, I think that you know, we've heard an awful lot about you know, collaboration over COVID. I think collaboration is going to be a very big word, I think, for January one as well, where we'll need to get growers to collaborate to deliver to one place in Holland to get a consolidated phytosanitary position for certainly for plants to start off with and how we then learn that for flowers. In answer to one of the colleague questions on the on the chat there from Turkey, obviously we try and encourage you as much as possible now to, to get used to doing direct phytosanitary requirements straight through New Europe into UK if possible. Um, and obviously, well, as from for January 1, another question that came in on the chat, and obviously high-risk plants, they will be being inspected mainly for Zyella, I understand, and Bermizia from January 1 as the major focus products. They will be ones that come under the risk. But we are we are definitely looking to, to change some of our models for direct supply into Europe and direct supply to UK. Um, you know, it's very, very fundamental that you know, bringing products from multi-countries will have some phytosanitary challenges to get them all to come together at the same time. And uh, do you think the ports of entry are um, ready? Do you think there is the uh, capacity there to cope with the extra checks which will be required for product coming directly in? I think they're building, uh, Nigel maybe answer this better than me, I think they're building capacity quite quickly. I think they've certainly built capacity in inspectors quite quickly over the past few months. Um, I think we're all trying to uh, maybe second guess which port's going to be the busiest. Obviously, Dover would be number one on the list, but everybody's sort of now saying, well, if we, everybody moves to another port, then um, we could end up thinking that actually Dover could become quite quiet because everybody moves to a different place. So we are watching that obviously very closely to see, see how that works. But um, I think border control posts, when they come into play, will be the, the next real sort of critical factor of how we actually move that. You know, we've, have heard there's one going to be one in Spalding, which obviously is the, is the center of, uh, of the, the fresh produce hub, which would be really useful, I think, to to move that forward. So, you know, I'm sure Nigel and his team have been working quite closely with the government as well to make sure that we do have adequate uh, actions in place and adequate inspectors in place to be able to cope with this. And I think they're building quite quickly. Nigel, do you want to comment on that, on the capacity of the UK for coping with these extra checks? Thanks, Tim. Um, look, clearly accept that's a, a major concern from an industry perspective, but um, you you, uh, you will be aware that I mentioned the date of the 1st of July a little while ago. That's a key date where a number of new government facilities should come online. And Ian just mentioned there are a number of commercial uh, facilities being developed, the one in Spalding, for example, and I I fully envisage there'll be others around the, the country as well. But in the short term, from the 1st of January um, for plants, um, you will be allowed to, your goods can transit to what is called a place of destination. So it could be your UK facility or your customer's UK facility um, for those products. But that will only be available for plants because it's only applicable to plants for that period of time and would not be an option as we speak from the 1st of July onwards. Although we are encouraging uh, the UK government to perhaps 
take a more flexible approach uh, from the 1st of July onwards. But as Ian's already mentioned, there have been a considerable number of new inspectors appointed. So they are, the, 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 the people are there. It's a question of ensuring the facilities are there, but you know, the, the UK government has committed to do its utmost to allow those inspections to be away from ports, particularly row row ports, to ensure there aren't those logistical um, holdups that people are frankly dreading. Yeah, yeah, there certainly is a, a big concern for um, products like flowers and. I wonder, are the issues that you see for flowers any different to what you see for the rest of fresh produce that you are handling within your organization as well? Nigel, did you hear that? Uh, you're on uh, mute, I think, Nigel. Sorry, Tim. The dynamics there of flowers, you know, are more important because of their sheer level of perishability. But there are many other fruit and vegetable items that are just as perishable that we purchase from Europe. You know, there's a, a good reason why we buy many of these products from Europe. And it is about those highly efficient, just in time processes that we are all very keen to maintain as much as possible to ensure that business efficiency. Um, but we are constantly reinforcing uh, to government that these processes need to adopt the and relate to the shelf life of the products that we're, we're talking about because as an industry we will continue to be committed to providing fantastic high quality products at the most attractive prices possible and we need government support to allow that to happen. Okay. Thank you. Um, there was a question asking about uh, just if you could explain a little more on what uh, what things can be deferred uh, in terms of some of the regulatory requirements from the 1st of January to July. Okay, um, I think we need to be very clear on this. The When I mentioned about deferment, the only aspect that you can defer from the 1st of July, or 1st of, sorry, let me start again. The only aspect that you can defer from the 1st of January would be your customs processes and potential declarations and duty payments. But I would I would take significant advice before you choose to take that option. You doesn't mean to say you'll never pay those fees if fees are applicable. At some point you will be required to provide that information, certainly no later than the first of July. So it is only for that customs process, it's that alone. Um, I think I saw a chat about, um, you know, when will inspections take place? Be very clear, the 1st of January is what is called high priority plants. In essence, it's plants with roots. There are some other items included, such as potatoes, but cut flowers and, and other fruit and vegetables are not involved until uh, documentary systems on the 1st of April and potential physical inspections on the 1st of July. So it is important that you understand you know, the different phase process for the range of products that you are looking to market in the UK. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. There's a question, Nigel, I'm going to stick with you for this one. Does the 8% duty tariff apply for trade between Northern Ireland and the UK? <laughs> I love these easy questions. Um, in reality, yes. Yeah, um, the trading from Great Britain to Northern Ireland is going to be, from a bureaucracy point of view, a whole lot more complex than it's ever been before. So fighters, from a fighter sanitary point of view, if the goods are being exported from GB to Northern Ireland, you will have to go through that formal export process of um, having a phytosanitary certificate and much more. In terms of duty and VAT and other things, in essence, the broad principle is that there will be a border in the Irish Sea. But I have to say, my advice I've just given is the broad principles of where we currently stand, but the UK government 
still got an awful lot of information to provide so that is absolutely clear the process they will adopt okay thank you um ian um I wonder, have you felt that retailers are making any uh, changing plans or making uh, different contingency plans uh, as a result of Brexit coming up, or are they just leaving it all to you to sort out? Um, I think there's a, there's you know, the word contingency is, is is overused in a number of different areas, but um, certainly there's a there's a lot of plans afoot at the moment to make sure there's additional additional activity and additional stock going into the system to to manage what we're anticipating to be quite a transport challenge yeah, and, a, and a movement challenge. I think the big one that they are all aware yeah, and they're very much kept in the brief and very much in the loop and actually what's happening within the, the marketplace at the moment and actually what the potential um, impact will be from that product from the, from the 1st of January. Um, we certainly are seeing at the moment, yeah, we are seeing that they basically haven't changed any fundamental plans. But I can see as we move into some of the higher peaks, for instance, into Valentine's and Mother's Day, then those areas, if there are still no deals and there's tariff issues and also as well, if there's fighter sanitary challenges, then there will be some opportunity to look at other, other supply channels. But at the moment, yeah, they are you know, silently hoping for, a, for a, a deal, I think, in some areas. But we're well aware that fighter sanitary issues are going to be the biggest challenge for them going forward and also going into Northern Ireland and Ireland for, for that retail climate is going to be quite quite the biggest challenge actually. And uh, in terms of the uh, extra costs which um, uh, Eileen was talking about, Ian, um, are the retailers thinking that they're, they're going to be the price of flowers to the consumer is going to be going up or uh, are they looking to the supply chain to deal with that differently? I think the, the, usual, the usual answer to that question is the supply chain will be trying to work a way to mitigate the cost or the added cost into that position. Um, I think you know, if we get to the to the Aline's 20% number, yeah, that will have a significant impact on actually that sort of, uh, that sort of on cost situation. Um, and that will be the biggest one there will be obviously mitigation of numbers of stems in bouquets, for example. Um, so rather than selling 12, you'll sell 10. And those sorts of things will be the first offer, but obviously that hits volume uh, and that will obviously then hit the continental plan because obviously everybody's already grown this stuff. You know, a lot of this stuff's obviously in the ground. So there will be some pressure, I'm sure, with volume versus value you know, going into January. Um, but that is shall be and and the UK is not a is not a significant grower of cut flowers, but do you feel that this will increase as a result of these changes? I think we're seeing a, we've already seen a move by retail to to look at UK or closer to home product where where as where as possible as much as possible. I think seasonal flowers you know, took a quite a big boom this year. Um, even even though we were going through a lockdown situation, the seasonal flower market was pretty strong. I think it will come back to a to a campaign I've talked to Nigel about before, yeah, called Britain in Bloom. Yeah, there will be some challenges there, I'm sure, this year to get something off off the off from the market. Um, we got COVID nineteen this year, I think, before we got into that sort of challenge. But there will definitely be a move, I think, to see a higher potential opportunity for UK growers where possible to take a a larger share of the market for the UK consumer. Um, that is going to be you know, something that we will see, whether it be the tulip market. Or, or some of that, there will be definitely a, a, an opportunity there. Like everything, wherever there's a change in, in business, you know, normal ways of working, there's an opportunity for others to be to capitalise on that. And, and do you expect more packers to, uh, more packing operations to be set up within the UK um, to avoid this issue of the, uh, the tariff having to come through from the EU, for example? I don't think so. I don't think the packing side of it will be coming through very much. I think there is obviously the plants one will be a challenge. We don't want to sort of go into too much plants today, but the plants one will be a challenge because an awful lot of the plant market is supplied directly from Holland. So that is a packing challenge and actually how that passporting works will go forward will, will actually impact, I think, on what can be done in the UK. Um, as a cut flower market, I think that one's going to still be um, there's still a lot of that's already done in the UK, so there'll be a, a potential to, to, for other areas already where there's capacity in some places 
to do more. And you may see where you've got seasonal growers that basically UK seasonal growers that could actually expand their packing operations to do more product you know, all year round rather than just having a seasonal business or a seasonal packing operation. But that, again, will be very much labour dependent. Uh, I think that will be the biggest one that will drive the, uh, the challenges, I think, in that market in terms of labour profile. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if Augusto is still with us. Maybe it, I think he's still there. Just put your camera on if you are not or you can hear. Um, uh, but uh, ah, ah, here you are, yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we, we hear you. There is you. something wrong with the video or something. Uh, I have it on, but uh, there's like a black out there or something. But I'm here. I'm here. Okay, we can hear you. I, I just wondering, Augusto, your growers have been uh, pioneering uh, some uh, transport of flowers by sea. And I wondered if this may be something you will uh, pursue more from Colombia as a result of Brexit. Oh, yes, I think so. Uh, because as I told you, uh, air transportation is limited right now. It's very difficult. And uh, uh, I think uh, it will. As a matter of fact, I think uh, our, our main destination with sea transportation is the UK, is Tesco. So uh, we have uh, the knowledge is the whole thing is working with our authorities here and with the ports. Uh, that's the possibility we have, certainly. I think uh, that's, that's the kind of thing that uh, may happen. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to uh, close off by um, asking Nigel what he is, what is his main asks? What You're talking to government about these things. So one of the reasons we ask you to talk about this topic is we feel we've got to probably get a clearer response than if we just asked government to talk about it. So I think, what are you asking government now to get the, to help this industry uh, as as we come towards January the first, um, I, I think in one word, Tim, it'd be very simple: clarity. Tell me what you want, when you want it, and how do you want it. There are, whilst we've been able to provide a considerable number of answers today and, and to FPC members, there are still key aspects which remain unknown. And it's you know we are now days away from the first of January, so from a plant sector, some of those elements and some of that information is essential without being complacent i would um i think it's positive that we've been able to negotiate with the uk government a phased approach both for cut flowers and for fruit and vegetables but don't waste the first few months of next year thinking tomorrow will do it's important we want to understand the issues and appreciate as we move forward please share your issues with fpc it's important that we have a full understanding of the whole supply chain so we can do our utmost to influence the most pragmatic and commercially effective solutions that we're able to do with the new regulations the UK government is, in, is beginning to enforce. Okay, thank you. Well, I think I've picked up most of the questions from uh, the audience. If there are any that we've missed, we will have a look through them and we will try to uh, send them on to you by email. Also, this uh, webinar will be available to watch again. We recorded it, and so uh, we will let you have the link uh, for that by email. I want to just take this opportunity to really thank all of our speakers and those and uh, that have helped us today in uh, understanding what we're facing in the coming weeks and into next year and beyond with Brexit, uh, the short term and the long term, and. Thinking, we've been thinking a little bit more strategically as well about the industry, as well as the immediate uh, operational challenges which are faced. Uh, and of course, there are still many questions that we have. We don't know about the phytosanitary certification and how it will come in. We don't know about uh, many things, but the ta whether there's a deal or not. But um, it's good to see we are supported by organizations who are really uh, investigating this and trying to support our industry as we tackle these problems uh, together on both sides of the channel. So I would really like to thank all of you very much for giving up your time and for supporting this event. I'd like to thank the World Horty Centre as well um, for 
um, their support in running this uh, webinar and providing the technical support to everybody. This has been really uh, much appreciated. I hope that we will be able to run events like this together for you again. And where we get more news, we will pass it on. Please subscribe to Floriculture International Magazine, where we will also seek to keep you updated on the, on the topics there. It doesn't cost anything, so please uh, do it, and you'll find um, a lot of uh, useful information for your business in there. So I am now going to uh, refer back to uh, Youp, uh, back at the uh, World Horty Center, and I pass back over to him and uh, thank again all the speakers and thank you to all the audience who've joined us today thank you thank you thanks again to all the speakers i will avoid um, naming everyone because of time but thanks again sharing your insights um, also the guests thanks for attending um one remaining uh, thing tim just made um, a comment about floriculture international very important media partner um we look forward to strengthening the collaboration between World Horty Center, AAPH, and Floriculture International, and keep bringing you um, important knowledge and events like this. So if you have an interest in those, please um, check worldhortysociety.nl or check the site worldhortycenter.nl and you'll find the society right there. That's our community of businesses, um, research, and government organizations collaborating and sharing their uh, latest practices and knowledge. Um, thank you also to the Dutch Ministry of Agriculture. We forgot to mention them, but you've seen them in the chat going on, responding to many of those questions as well. Um, they're also very, um, yeah, how, how would you say that? We're very proud to have them as a partner uh, of the World Horty Center as well. Um, the World Horty Society keeps you just in the loop of um, current uh, issues. So check that site, become a member of it, and um, shape the community also with your insights and knowledge. So thanks for um, your time. We wish you um, a nice weekend for now. In the UK, good luck with the snow, and uh, hopefully you'll come to a deal very, very soon and bring clarity in the darkness. Thanks again. Enjoy the weekend. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.